Hello. In this video, I will introduce the grounds of judicial review. That is, the basis on which the court will hold a decision of an administrative body, the Human Rights Commission, for example, to be unlawful. This builds on my previous mini-lecture, What is Administrative Law?, which you should have watched for week one. The second week one mini-lecture, The Function of Judicial Review, can be watched before or after this one. The textbook Van Harten talks about three grounds of judicial review, and a fourth, unconstitutionality, which I will talk about in passing. The three grounds are illegality, irrationality and procedural impropriety. This enumeration of the grounds comes from the decision of Lord Diplock in an English case, the Crown against Minister for Civil Service, ex parte Council and Civil Service Unions, more commonly known as the GCHQ case. You would have come across that case when you studied public law in your first year, or for a few of you in your second year. Now, when you read my article with T.T. Arvind, The Curious Origins of Judicial Review, you will find that I am very critical of Lord Diplock's approach to judicial review. I think that in many ways that he was on a mission to reform the law of judicial review in a way that diverted it away both from its common law roots and to take the force out of many of the voices in the 1960s calling for radical reform of the law. And many of these voices were in fact deeply rooted in the common law tradition, even if they wanted to see the law change. So instead of talking about the Diplockian approach to judicial review, I'm going to talk about four English cases in the 1960s. Together they are called the Quartet and they all feature a leading decision of Lord Reed. And if you will excuse me a moment of self-congratulation, my forthcoming edited book, Executive Decision Making in the Courts, is a reconsideration of administrative law in the light of the concerns and the legacy of the Quartet. These cases have been influential in the development of administrative law in Canada too. This is well illustrated by the first case, Ridge and Baldwin, and its influence on the Canadian case of Nicholson. So let us turn to that first case, Ridge and Baldwin. And it really pleases me to teach this case to Sussex students because it concerns a now mostly forgotten episode called the Great Conspiracy Case concerning corruption in Brighton Police Force that really extended from the top to the bottom of the force. And once it is safe to do so, you could take a visit to the old police cells museum in Brighton where you can find out all about that case. In a corruption trial of four officers at the Old Bailey, the judge said to two of the accused, neither of you had the professional and moral leadership which both of you should have had and were entitled to expect from the Chief Constable of Brighton. The Chief Constable that the judge was referring to was Charles Ridge. And although the authorities had found it impossible to convict Ridge for lack of evidence, few were in any doubt that the other officers who were charged and convicted had at the very least acted with the tacit approval of Ridge. And it was also clear that as long as Ridge headed the force, the credibility of the Brighton police was on the line, for example, when officers testified in criminal cases. So the watch committee... The local government body, then responsible for overseeing the local police force, met and took the decision to dismiss Ridge. Ridge's solicitor later appeared before the committee, where he was received, as the reports say, with courtesy and in silence. The watch committee, by a majority, affirmed its original decision. Ridge challenged his dismissal in court. The issue was not so much that he thought he could continue to lead the Brighton force. He knew his leadership authority was discredited. But if he was allowed to resign rather than be dismissed, then he would have kept his police pension. And the principal argument he put forward was that because he was dismissed without a hearing, he was denied an opportunity to state in person the case as to why he ought not to be dismissed. In other words, this wasn't a challenge to the substance of the decision, whether it was correct or not, 
but about its procedural fairness. And the decision in Ridge set aside what was then recent precedent concerning what was then called the law of natural justice. The law was confused, claimed Lord Reed in his decision, because it failed to consider the different kinds of cases to which the rules of natural justice applied. There were three kinds of cases, according to Lord Reed. Dismissal of a servant by a master, and that's what we would now call an employment law case in the strict sense. Dismissal from an office held during pleasure and dismissal from office, where there must be something to warrant dismissal. As far as cases falling into the third category were concerned, and this included Ridge's case, a dismissal could not take effect without notifying the party of the allegations and providing a hearing in which he could contest the evidence against him. In the language of Canadian law, Lord Reed answered the threshold question by saying that procedural protections applied in situations where there must be something to warrant dismissal, and the question of the level or content of procedural protections by saying that Ridge was entitled to notice of the allegation against him and an opportunity to rebut them in person. The case has been influential in Canadian law In 1979, in a case called Nicholson, a majority of the Canadian Supreme Court ruled that a probationary police constable could not be dismissed arbitrarily without giving reasons for his dismissal. The Chief Justice Bora Laskin relied on Lord Reese's threefold classification in reaching the decision. More generally, Ridge exemplifies the vindicatory function of judicial review that I spoke about in the function of administrative law. It stands for the proposition that where an administrative body exercises a determinative or dispositive power over people's entitlements, the law will provide redress if such determinations are made in a manner that is unfair. But in the context of the 1960s, The case also stood for the willingness of the judiciary to assess whether the law was effective in fulfilling its function and to reconsider and rework the law to address the challenges of the modern administrative state. This theme is always prominent in Canadian administrative law. The second case is Padfield and Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. The case arose out of the milk marketing scheme. It's close to my heart because my dad was a farmer and although he never had a dairy, our neighbours, the Dows, did and back in the days when the milk marketing board still existed, I sometimes used to help milk their cows when their dairyman had a weekend off. Now, under the milk marketing arrangements, dairy farmers had to sell their milk to the milk marketing board The board sold the milk to consumers and the sums received by the board went into a pot of money out of which the farmers were paid. England was divided into 11 regions and the price paid was different in each region to reflect the economies of getting the milk to market from different places. Farmers in the southeast were paid a little extra for their milk compared to other regions. The justification was that they were closer to the major centres of consumption and so their cost of getting their milk to market was lower. They also faced higher capital costs as the price of farming land to rent or buy was more expensive. And although they were paid a little more, they felt that the differential was not enough. It didn't fully reflect their higher capital costs and lower transport and marketing costs. But they found that they couldn't change anything because the decision made by the Milk Marketing Board was by majority vote, and representatives of the other regions wouldn't approve a raise because this would reduce the amount of money that was available to pay farmers in other regions. The southeastern farmers thought they had a way out of their predicament. Section 19.3 of the Agricultural Marketing Act 1958 permitted the Minister of Agriculture to set up a committee of investigation whose recommendations could then be implemented by ministerial order, thus bypassing the need for the support of the other regions. Unfortunately for the southeastern farmers, the minister declined to set up such a committee. He gave various reasons for this, 
One of which was that if the complaint were referred and then upheld by the committee, then he would be expected to make a statutory order to give effect to the committee's recommendation. This was something that he was not willing to do as a matter of policy. And it was this decision, the decision not to set up a committee and the reason for not doing so that was the basis of the challenge in Padfield. Lord Reed again gives the lead judgment of a majority of the House of Lords. The minister, he said, didn't have to refer every complaint to a committee of investigation, but nor did he enjoy an unfettered discretion as to which complaints should be referred. The Agricultural Marketing Act provided no express limits on the power of the minister. Nonetheless, as Lord Reed says, Parliament must have conferred the discretion with the intention that it should be used to promote the policy and objects of the Act. The policy and objects of the Act must be determined by construing the Act as a whole, and construction is always a matter for the court. If the minister, by reason of his having misconstrued the Act, or for any other reason, so uses his discretion as to thwart or run counter to the policy and objects of the Act, then our law would be very defective if persons aggrieved were not entitled to the protection of the court. In other words, not only must executive decision makers exercise only those powers that are given to them, but only for the purpose for which the powers are given. The court's role in providing independent redress against administrative understandings of power extended as a result of Padfield not only to individual determinations, as it did in Ridge, but also to policy decisions. Padfield heralded a new era of partnership between the courts and Parliament. It was not the role of the courts to undermine by strict formalism the policies implicit in legislation, but the courts would ensure that discretionary policies adopted by the administration were faithful to the key scheme set out by Parliament, and that safeguards that Parliament had put in place to ensure that all relevant interests were taken into account could not be circumvented by ministers. Like Ridge, Padfield has also influenced the development of Canadian law. It was relied upon by Justice Binney in the case of QP, which is the foundational case in the modern functional and pragmatic analysis of the review of the legality of decisions. Again, we will come to what this means in another lecture. In this case, however, it seems that the Canadian courts got there two steps ahead of Lord Reed. In the 1959 case of Ron Carelli versus Duplessis, Rand and Justson justices said, discretion necessarily implies good faith in discharging public duty. There is always a perspective within which a statute is intended to operate. And any clear departure from its lines or objects is just as objectionable as fraud or corruption. This is very much Padfield avant la lettre, if you will pardon my French. The third case in the quartet is Conway and Rimmer. I won't talk about this case in too much detail because of all the cases in the quartet, it is the one which has been superseded by later developments, though it is still cited. If you want to know more about it, do ask for a copy of my chapter on Conway and Rimmer with T.T. Arvind. Michael Conway, a probationary constable, had been dismissed from the Cheshire Constabulary after being accused of the theft of a torch from the locker of his fellow constable. He had been prosecuted for the alleged theft on the recommendation of his superintendent, Thomas Rimmer, but had been acquitted. Despite his acquittal, he was dismissed on the basis of a probationary report. Conway, in return, sued Rimmer for malicious prosecution and and in the course of proceedings sought discovery of the confidential probationary reports made about him, as well as Rimmer's report recommending his prosecution. Now, by the laws of what was then called Crown Privilege, and now goes under the name of Public Interest Immunity, the government withheld the document, not because the documents themselves were sensitive, but because they belonged to a class of documents, in this case, police probationer reports, that it was not in the public interest to have disclosed. Those who wrote probationer reports, 
the government argued, would not do so candidly if they thought that someday what they wrote might someday be in the public domain. This is called the candour principle. Under a wartime decision of Duncan and Camel Laird, not only was the candour principle accepted, but any claim of class privilege was solely for the minister and not for the judge to decide. Conway abolished the class exception. It was no longer possible to assert that the documents should be withheld because they belonged to a class. Furthermore, the government could only assert privilege over individual documents. It was ultimately for the court to decide whether or not a particular document was exempt from production in court. The decision was considered in Cary versus Ontario. The case concerned a resort in northwestern Ontario, which was owned by the government and which was involved in a financial dispute with Cary. The government claimed class privilege with respect to cabinet papers. This was rejected by the Supreme Court of Canada, but Canada only gave one out of two must try harder to Conway and Rimmer. Although withholding documents on a class basis was generally not favoured, it was not altogether ruled out by the Supreme Court. But Canada followed Conway in holding that the importance of withholding production on the basis of a public interest must be weighed against the public interest in the proper administration of justice. And this is a task for the court, not the minister. Both the English and Canadian cases recognise the context of the state involvement in the lives of citizens on an everyday basis, and often at a fairly mundane level, a far cry from the concern with state papers that can be found in older case law. Finally, let us talk about the fourth of the quartet, Annas Minnick and Foreign Compensation Commission. Annas Minnick was a decision that took place in the aftermath of the Suez Canal crisis. In 1956, the United Kingdom, along with France and Israel, invaded Egypt to regain control of the Suez Canal, which had been nationalised by President Nasser. The military action was a disaster, but after the cessation of hostilities, the Egyptian government agreed to pay some money to compensate the British owners of property, which had been destroyed as a result of military action. The British government added to this sum, which was paid into a foreign compensation fund set up by the Foreign Compensation Act 1950. Anis Minnick wanted to challenge a ruling that they were not eligible for compensation under the fund. There were two problems with this. First was that Section 4, Subsection 2 of the Foreign Compensation Act stated that the determination by the Commission of any application made to them under this Act shall not be called into question in any court of law. This is known as a preclusive clause, or in the language that is more commonly used in Canadian law, a privative clause. The other problem was the careless drafting of the statutory instrument that provided for compensation to be paid to owners of property destroyed in the Suez affair. The Commission was forced, as a result, to choose between two competing interpretations of eligibility for compensation under the order. That of the Fund's own legal officer and Annas Minnick. Both of these produced anomalies and absurdities, but the Commission opted for its own legal officer's interpretation. What the House of Lords held was that Section 2, Subsection 4, did not altogether prevent the courts from reviewing the decision of the Foreign Compensation Commission. And this is often taken in critical readings of Annas Minnick to be the significant point. The Judicial Power Project accuses Annas Minnick of judicial adventurism, but in point of fact, the idea that a preclusive clause did not completely rule out the jurisdiction of the courts is an old one. What is really at the heart of the decision in Annas Minnick is the question of the limits of policy-making powers of administrative institutions. In the Enabling Act, the Foreign Compensation Act 1950, Parliament had set out in detail who should qualify for compensation, and the court would not prevent unauthorised departure from Parliament's policy. In passing the Foreign Compensation Act, Parliament had faced up to the controversial issue of who should qualify, 
and made a policy judgment on, ma on the matter of claims for compensation for losses suffered in times of war. It was not for an administrative tribunal to modify Parliament's instructions, even where the call for them to do so arose not from a deliberate attempt to enlarge its authority, but through the invidious choice created by a carelessly drafted order in council. This is a difficult decision to understand, especially in respect of the position it takes on distinguishing between errors of law which go to jurisdiction and those that do not. The existence of a privative clause in section 2 subsection 4 was, the House of Lords held, only intended by Parliament to exclude the courts from reviewing errors within jurisdiction. This is a subtle distinction, and one with which both the English and Canadian courts have tried to wrestle. In English law, in O'Reilly and Mackman, the judges finally threw in the towel and held that the courts would treat all errors as going to jurisdiction, so that, for practical purposes, the distinction was abolished. Canadian courts also wrestled with this distinction, but in a different way. In the past, the Canadian courts would use an expansive conception of jurisdictional error in order for the courts to control the expansion of the administrative states. This has led the courts more recently to talk about issues of true jurisdiction, to distinguish their approach from the more expansive approach of earlier times. But the issue still proves a tricky one, as you will see. The case of Crevier illustrates the way in which issues of jurisdiction are particularly important in relation to questions of federalism. When the Quebec legislature created a professions tribunal to hear appeals from the province's various professional disciplinary bodies, it sought to make decisions of the professions tribunal unreviewable. But because on the Supreme Court of Canada's reading of Section 96 of the Constitution Act, the superior courts had an inherent function of review, and because this inherent power had been excluded by the Quebec statute, the Supreme Court of Canada was not prepared, as Annas Minnick had done, to handle this issue as one of interpretation of the statute. Instead, it ruled the privative clause and the statute in which it appeared unconstitutional. You can see, of course, the differences between the powers and role of the British and Canadian courts here, due to the existence of an authoritative written constitutional text. Annas Minnick also illustrates the partnership between Parliament and the courts that we saw in Padfield, and it stands for the idea that there is no Alsatia in England, no area of legal admi or administrative power but is, that is beyond the reach of the courts. And the decision in Crevier stands for the same principle, albeit that its application is more complicated in the context of Canada's federal structure. So where does this get us? I have hopefully taught you something about the historic and continuing influence of English administrative law on the development of Canadian law. Remember this, and remember that you can draw on the cases you have learned about in your study of Public Law 1 to inform your understanding of Canadian administrative law. You do need to look at how the English principles and authorities have been received into Canadian law, as I did in preparing this mini-lecture. And while there is no doubt that Canadian administrative law has developed in its own direction, and that this has intensified since the 1980s, English and Canadian courts have often wrestled with the same kind of problems, like what counts as fair administrative procedures in different settings, how do we control the exercise of administrative discretion while recognising that the legislature has, quite properly, given a particular task to a minister or to an administrative agency, rather than to the courts? What should the courts do when the government tries to withhold documents from legal proceedings because it argues that the public interest in candor takes precedence over the public interest in the administration of justice? And how should the courts treat a direction by a legislature that a decision of a particular tribunal or body should not be reviewable? Think about this when you read Baker for the first workshop. For this first workshop, you are asked to read the case summary and then the summary of facts set out in the judgment and the statutory context, which are, can be found on pages 825 to 832. You might want to read these pages first and then ask yourself, 
What sort of issues arising in the quartet also arise in Baker? What would the answers given by the quartet suggest a Canadian court might like to decide to ensure that Mavis Baker received administrative justice? You will soon find out that the answers given by the Supreme Court of Canada were quite different in important respects, but the questions with which they wrestled had a lot in common. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.